Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is special guest host Mario from Blockstream and the Unhashed Podcast. Hello, Mario. Hi. And also, uh, Cairo Zagorius, um, also known as Cairo, and um, Bitcoiner. <laughs> I think this is the best way I can, I can describe you. Hey, thanks for having me. Cool. Um, so, Cairo, can you uh, tell us, for listeners and viewers that aren't, aren't familiar with you, uh, a little bit about your background? Okay, well, I, it's nothing really special. I did an English VA back in a while. And recently, I, I graduated with my master's in social sciences. And that's basically it. And I've basically been researching Bitcoin ever since I started my MA. Awesome. So what got you into Bitcoin? And why Bitcoin only? Uh, well, it's a long story. Yeah, I basically started first interacting with Bitcoin in 2016. But I did hear about it earlier in 2011, so I just kind of discarded it back then. But in 2016, another furry friend of mine gave me 0.3 Bitcoin back then. And it was really interesting because he was trying to tell me, like, you know, just the number goes up and all this stuff. And he was, you know, trying to speculate. And I didn't really care about it back at that time. And I kind of blasted it away and bought my first Steam game. And then I just took everything out on Bitstamp and just spent everything on clothes and stuff. And then a year went on and... I saw like Bitcoin's price started going up and I asked him, hey, can I have some more Bitcoin? And he actually gave me again, but like this time he only gave me 3 million Satoshis, <laughs> which was a lot less than the before one. I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> and then, yeah, this is when he started getting interesting. And then sadly, I started shitcoining. <laughs> I don't know if I should say, but I basically bought the worst of it all. And I started this, you know, this crazy journey. I lived through the entire 2070 bull run and I saw like a massive amount of Bitcoin amassing on my portfolio value and then, you know, see it kind of vaporizing away over time. And that's why kind of after the bull run, I started like kind of thinking like, what is going on here? Because it was so weird that I somehow made so much money out of so little because I put such little amount in it just like for playing and things, trying something out. And <clears throat> and I managed to somehow ride the wave. And then, you know, I went into this this thing about philosophizing about, you know, what is this thing? How how value gets created out of nowhere? Or like how is this even possible? Is this a scam or I'm playing some sort of stupid game here? And I wasn't really sure about it. And I started puzzling the pictures together. I started observing all the coins I had, like the narratives going on in them. And I slowly started like figuring out this is something wrong here, that they are trying to copy something or something going on here. And that's what I, sometime in July, I noticed that like something is going on with Bitcoin. And in 2018, and that's when I started some slowly going on this path. But even before that, I, you know, I was like, I, I basically was out of the university already with my BA, and I was like, like maybe I just want to, you know, wait a tiny bit more. So I decided like going for a master's degree, and I wasn't really sure what I'm gonna research, or even I'm gonna research this. But in August, it actually got confirmed that I can research Bitcoin here, and I do stuff like I can force it through the Hungarian educational system here because it's so easy to use it. And like you know, I was back then you're thinking about cryptocurrency or something like that. You know, gonna research it. But then from September, as more as I. Because I kind of took a position on Bitcoin in August, because I was so determined to see it go through with it, and then basically I started, you know, morphing towards more towards Bitcoin. And my fucking buy order in November got uh, confirmed, and I was like, "Holy shit, what's going on here?" Because I kind of predicted it's gonna go down to like three thousand euros or something. <laughs> Went all in, kind of, and then. I noticed that, you know, like the differences between the shit coins and the Bitcoin uh, space is, is like phenomenal. They're like trying to copy all the properties and like somehow uh, like they're resenting that they're not within Bitcoin while still trying to, you know, improve upon it. But it cannot be improved upon because, you know, you cannot copy parts of Bitcoin or its social aspects. 
at all. So, you know, I, I embarked on this crazy journey here with, with this research. Like, although I was, it was really weird how I started out because I went to Shitcoin conference first time. I went to Zcon 1 where I met with people like uh, Falkenberg, have you met Mizuko and all these other crazy people there? And it was, I, by the time I didn't have any shit coins left, so I, I sold everything. I only had Bitcoin, and I was I just wanted to see like, is the mentality is really what I'm thinking? Because you know, I would think like some like MLM games, scams, people going left and right, shilling products. It wasn't really a shilling shit show, but more like I saw the mentality that the people were, you know, stuck in this little world of competition that they kind of thought was going to be fun. But but then I kind of figured out that this is this is just not going to work. It's just going to collapse over time. That's when, you know, I saw even Zuko lying into the face of everybody and saying, like, yeah, we're going to go all in, double speed, put money into the project, and not even a month pass, and it's like, we're going to pivot. We're going to ask for more mining subsidy to happen. Like, and then, like, you know, just, you know, lying into people's face. You don't even have this much integrity to, you know, to, to, to go through with stuff you lie into people's face. But then, you know, that was it. That was the end of it. And that's when I kind of went out to Bratislava to, to meet with the guys at Paranopolis. I mean, Paranopolis, I mean. And I spent like a week, you know. I met uh, Giacomo Zucco there, who went there to hold a... Uh, presentation about quantum computing and all this stuff. We had a really great time there. And that's for like the, the first time I really interacted with Bitcoiners in the real world. And that's, that's when I kind of figured out this is this, there's much more to it than, than what I really observed in the beginning. And I really have to, you know, look more into it. So I went to places. I went to the Hackers Congress and I went this year also to Guns of Bitcoin meetup in Switzerland. And, you know, the whole fees is sort of like morphing out, you know, like, like what are this, this, what trust is, you know, playing role in society and with these, you know, these, this, uh, with Bitcoin basically, the crypto so like in the trash already, but more like, like what, what is going on within society? And, and basically this was my, you know, going down the rabbit hole basically. <laughs> It's very deep rabbit hole, that's for sure. Yeah, it's 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 an insanely deep rabbit hole. It's still not over. It's like, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> no one, no one's found the bottom. <laughs> it, 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 there's no, there's no. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm near, but it's like, I'm not sure if, if it is possible to even to you know approximate like how deep it goes. But now this is like how can I become a Bitcoiner? It's like I I see people, I see how they behave, and I and I saw the purity there, the purity of interest, and in, in, like how people. Uh, do stuff or what they do it's just you know kind of phenomenal here and it's kind of like totally attracted me into the space as a bitcoiner that's why i thought there's absolutely no way back or no way out of it that's what my other people like like katoshi would say like that you know you you either die a hero or or live long enough to shitcoin or you start with shitcoins and you become the best bitcoiner ever so like that's the two options basically <laughs> and like kind of like the the second one happened to me so but that's really interesting, like this turn. But there's many, many Bitcoiners here who started out like this that I know. So that's quite interesting. You said, you said there are or aren't that many Bitcoiners? There right. are many Bitcoiners who yeah, started out this Yeah, it seems like a standard thing. You come in the space, oh, what's this Bitcoin thing? Look, there's more of them. And then you dive in there. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually yeah, yeah. you find your way back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like a full circle. Yeah. You start thinking like maybe something else can, you know, repeat the cycle. Maybe not. And then you just end back up here. Yeah. Basically, that's the truth. Yeah. Cool. Um, Mario, I'm curious, what's your Bitcoin origin story? Oh, I've never never told you this one. Um, I I don't I don't like to brag, but I actually skipped the whole shitcoin phase. I um I <laughs> I was uh, I was an English teacher in uh, in Seoul in South Korea for most of my twenties, and uh, yeah, I just had some some guy at a bar I was like raving about it this time, and I thought it was kind of interesting, and then I forgot about it for a year. And then, um, yeah, it just kind of popped back into my head. And so I uh, looked up uh, a meetup group, meetup.com, and there happened to be one, like, walking distance from my place. It was run by, uh, uh, by a bunch of English-speaking expats. Um, uh, yeah, it was Ruben Thompson's meetup. He's the guy who did state chains. Anyway, so I rolled up, and, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. They were cool guys. Um, I, I only understood maybe 10 or 20% of what they were saying, but uh, they kind of gave me homework each week, and I was hooked from the start. Um, but they they kind of um, shut down my uh, interest in 
altcoins pretty quickly. Like, not, not harshly, just like they presented the counter arguments um, to me very, very early. And also a few weeks after I got interested was when the DAO uh, exploded. You guys remember that? And so I, I think that also was pretty convincing for me. Like, okay, yeah, maybe a lot of this, a lot of the kind of grander promises of altcoins aren't that great, especially because that was kind of like the, the big kind of, I don't know, I guess, crown drool of what, you know, um, of what uh, altcoins could deliver at the time. And uh, so I think it was, yeah, it was lucky. It was lucky for my part that I kind of landed with a good group and the timing as well. So anyways, yeah, I just kind of stuck with that, um, with that meetup group for a couple of years, learned a lot. And uh, yeah. Cool. So you took the educational part. And actually, that's the third way to get into Bitcoin, because that's how I kind of read to my teacher also. So my, my physics consultant, hmm. he, I, I actually bought his first Bitcoin too after like like a year talking about all this stuff. Although he used a shitcoin to buy the Bitcoin. That was the most interesting part. <laughs> oh, it's, it's usually the other way around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, as long as people end up <clears throat> in Bitcoin, um, I think that's uh, that's key. So let's get into your paper, uh, Bitcoin and sure. the Trust Problem. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, Bitcoin and the Trust Problem. Uh, is Bitcoin adoption accelerated by the abuse of trust? So interesting title. Can you walk us through your main thesis? OK, so uh, the title was changed like a couple of times for some OPSEC reasons, because there were some problems. Let's just not talk about it. But other than that, uh, uh, this is like something that I try to like, you know, think in a way like how trust is kind of functioning in society. Because somehow when I started, you know, exploring Bitcoin, I started like there's some distrust probably towards financial systems and politics. And I, you know, I wanted to really research it. So I kind of like, you know, use this entire course in order to, you know, see if I can get any input that kind of drives me towards, you know, the topic. And And I was right. I got some really good input. And I started going, reading stuff about, you know, how trust functions in society, how, you know, these things relate to it. And then I started, you know, observing people also, like, you know, on the internet, going to field and all these kind of stuff. But the the whole thing was that, you know, how I did it in the paper was that I, I kind of like described the problems that we currently face or people face in the world, like like the issues they have with the banking system. Like, for example, in the U.S., people have barely any good access to the financial system, like 230 million people are like uh, not not really on like hundreds. I'm not pretty sure how much is the number anymore, but a lot of people are financially str struggling. So like having a good bank account, the fees are too high, banks impose, uh, you know, really interesting method. I mean, these tactics, you know, make people go into overdraft fees and like... It, it just kind of appeared like the whole banking system is like set up against people. And the whole problem was that is that the book I read about this to get, you know, really into the topic wasn't, was really trying to, you know, uh, go into ways how it could be fixed, but it was so close to the, to the solution that it totally missed it because actually it was talking about one of the shit coins that uh, got me in the first place. And like, it was just so weird that like the author wasn't able to you know, comprehend this problem that maybe it's the financial system that's causing the entire problem for people. Cause then like, for example, if you take a look at it, like for example, uh, the deposit, uh, uh, you know, there's FDIC uh, insurance on deposits, for example. They don't prevent banks from, you know, doing shady business. That basically allows banks in order to, you know, take up higher risk and, you know, play more with people's money. Because there is, you know, there is no, you know, any negative effect for them. Because, you know, the Federal Reserve is always going to come and bail them out or something. And people are always going to get their get back some of their money, at least some of it, up to $100,000 or something. And, like, that's, that's the most interesting part. But all these kind of regulations are there and how people are made, how people have their lives made impossible. Like, like in New York, people have to use check cashers and st stuff like that. Like that's not life. So you can't, you know, participate in the economy if you don't have a bank account, basically. But now Bitcoin's here and it kind of solves all this problem throughout the internet. Like it's so good. You don't have to buy any more Amazon gift cards with paper money to, you know, be able to buy stuff on Amazon or something. Now you can just use Bitcoin, you know, transact with people peer to peer and whatever. And I, after that, I kind of started exploring like how the media is playing narratives and like how this probably contributing to it. But I wasn't really sure if this 
was really a good choice. But I think I did manage to reach that because, you know, also the the whole point with the role of the media is that the media tries to, you know, play an overseer part over our democracy. They like, mm -hmm. see like how the government functions. And now ever since the, you know, this, this you know, the breakdown of trust in the media started with Donald Trump, we can see that like people don't really trust the media anymore. Even it started before Obama. And, and then, just kind of like calling this and a thing that people don't know what to think anymore and where they get their, their information from. So they need to like go to many places and alternative ideas start coming up and then they start, you know, questioning the narrative. And that's when we, you know, kind of arrived at this point. Then I started looking into politics, like how it kind of plays out in the US, Hungary, other places. And I just thought it generalized, you know, this build of a distrust towards politics also, which kind of like, looks more like that it's, it's pulling people apart. It's, it's setting sides against each other and like left and the right. And it kind of like breaking down society as it is. Yeah, the artificial but, yeah. divide. Yeah, the artificial divide, it's, it's massive, it's, it's crazy. The, like there was this, uh, this, uh, uh, this few research about it, that uh, how big this, this ideological divide is, like you know, back in 2005, 2006, the, the ideology between you know, the liberals and the conservatives was much tighter. They had the overlapping ideology. But now it, like, it's totally separate, like a massive gap there, and there's no way to you know, overlap the two. But Bitcoin somehow fixes this because, because I, I observed that the people who also have different ideology here, like someone's leftist or a conservative or something, they, they could be agreeing on the financial system and be able to reach consensus on their political ideology also because now it's, the whole thing is somehow on libertarian ideology now. It's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree. Then I read uh, Sipes' book, The Bitcoin Standard, and it kind of torpedoed my entire theory. <laughs> And that's when I had to like, like bring in this massive thing about uh, monetary nationalism, because apparently paper money creates the entire problem for us. It's 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 such a deeply rooted problem. Like like we use paper money every day in our life, and like it's it's such an important tool that we don't even comprehend its importance and what it's what this little piece of paper can do to one person. It's like, it's so crazy. Like, for example, like, like when, when people, you know, when people produce value, when, when you're working, you're producing value and you earn money for it. But the fact is that when, even when you earn that money, the Federal Reserve already printed out some amount of money already. So it's not, not sometimes it's, it stops printing. It's always printing. You have to, you know, always imply that something printing happening all the time because, you know, somehow the money is flowing into people's pockets or even trickling down. So there's a constant inflation going on. So you are working, but your, your, their produced value is immediately decreasing in, 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 in paper money. And that's when it kind of, kind of starts changing the human time preference. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's not something that I understand what the, what the exact mechanism is, but it's really apparent that that paper money somehow managed to rise up society's time preference to such such high level that, that you know that we now see there's these massive bubbles going on, overspending, overconsumption, uh, poverty, climate change is happening because of this too. Also, like for example, like every year there's a new iPhone, you just have to buy it, and then you know what do you do with the old iPhones? Ends up in China on a dump or something, and then it's, you know somebody breaks it down, ends up in the sea contributes to climate change and it just the whole cycle is just so, so evil it's just crazy basically there's you know this whole if, if, whole time preference problem is basically the underlying problem that causes everything because paper money basically corrupted human civilization as it is because you know how central banks are manipulating the value of money that's how somehow you know destroying everything everything that we built throughout the millennia and then you know when gold started disappearing and when the more control over money started coming in it the, the fabric of society starts breaking down that's when it's an optimization of the family happens and more you know more divorces happen if you take a look at japan for example look at the aging population there so few are are trying to you know have uh, bear children or enter into marriages because you know in Japan, like the one, what I what I suspect is that probably is because Japan's uh, a massive uh, uh, GDP. To, I mean, debt to GDP ratio. What they have 
kind of represents like this this whole thing that you know they're producing they have like a, um, how would i say they have to spend more and make more money and they keep spending spending and this you know this kind of doesn't allow people to have uh, stable families because they can't save they can't have a baby and then you know it's like people starts getting older society start getting older and this is a big problem and it just you know it, it's so weird that that we tolerated this whole thing for like over like uh, hundred years now, and only now it's starting to you know come down on us that that the, the paper money is the problem. It's, it's what I, I don't know. It was Marty Ben who said like that if we if we fix the money, we we fix the world. Yeah, that's really that's really actually oh. true. Like that that's what Bitcoin does basically. Like the properties of Bitcoin basically is so, so effective at solving the paper money problem that. That uh, it's phenomenal. It just it's 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 uh, censorship resistant. It cannot be duplicated. It immediately solved the money counterfeiting problem. Nobody was able to solve that. Not even digital ones. Hackers were able to you know print money into their bank accounts. They just spent it. It's just crazy. Like it can be sent even offline or satellite. Somebody can censor it. It stores value even though it's right now it's volatile as fuck. But it still works. And and we can see like it, it's slowly reintroducing back into people's life, you know, the importance of saving. I know that's this effect of saving is, is a natural force toward lowering time preference. Because when, you know, when you see that, that you, when you're producing value over time and you're putting into a storage medium like Bitcoin, you see its value keep being constant. Because, you know, the amount of Bitcoin that you own is, is still the same that you owned. There's not going to be more than 21 million Bitcoins later. Just 21 million. Mm-hmm. And the New York Federal Reserve cannot print more of it. <laughs> That's the thing. And, and you know, even though the value of the dollar, I mean, value of Bitcoin in dollar changes, but in the the amount of Bitcoin you have is never going to change. And this is what kind of like I observe is starting to really change the mentality of people here. And this is a really good thing. And we will see like within probably 20, 30 years of uh, a slow reverse on this whole effect here, or probably a total reverse. I'm not really sure. I wouldn't really bet on it, but we could probably see a near one. And then I kind of went in my paper more into, you know, the social aspect of, you know, the whole Bitcoin ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, I did I did the in-between part about, uh, you know, how wallets function and everything else, all these things. But, but uh, my main, actually, my main contribution is basically like this whole research on the social aspect of Bitcoin. Because, you know, uh, it's it's not enough that you have a shit coin and you you have a lot of developers. If there are no users, the people there who defend it or or use it, then there's absolutely nothing behind it. A government anything can come in, invade your coin somehow with fake developers, and then push through changes that you know they think could work or or make it you know like into their own bid do their own bidding. <clears throat> And this is what the social layer basically kind of, you know, prevents from, uh, you know, happening. Because there are people who actively keep defending, you know, the Bitcoin protocol. Like they are on Twitter. They keep talking to each other. They're networking. They're talking to whoever they are They are able to. And then they're really vehemently, you know, protecting Bitcoin. And this is important. There, There, there might be like other coins that like have the same you know, people there defending it, but it's not as not as strong as with Bitcoin. And this is really important. Uh, so like, let's say, this, this this is unique because, you know, money never really had in history a group of people defending it. We don't have gold, you know, being defended by, you know, uh, militiamen or something or something near that. But well, you, Bitcoin you does. Would. You would, but for the rulers only. Yeah, yeah for I was the rulers. Say, I think, yeah, I think say, uh, yeah. sound sound money has never had um, is yeah the, those defenders. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah obviously. So I guess more abstract here. So like people took a much more different turn here. But this is a good thing because you know all this trolling on Twitter also makes it more you know resilient. So like you see people there interacting, and like how would I say? Kind of difficult to explain because it's like it's so complex. 
<laughs> Are you trying to explain Bitcoin? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to explain like this whole social and I'm kind of getting into like a spaghetti and just, oh. Okay. Uh, so uh, one thing that stuck out to me, I'm just looking at your uh, your article that you wrote on Citadel 21. Um, okay. And uh, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, you know human trust and reputation in this space. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could comment on, you know, it, it, how important uh, having reputation is versus, uh, you know, there probably are a very, very significant number of, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoiners who no one knows about because they just keep their identity secret. They hold their coins, oh, yeah. um, uh, which is, you know, uh, kind of the flip side of that. You know, in the in the old banking system, there was no option to hold money anonymously. You know, you had to have some custodian keeping tabs on you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, have you thought about the the dynamic between um, you know building a reputation and maintaining it uh, versus opting out of the whole reputation game? The whole reputation, yeah, it's really interesting because the majority of people are not even using Twitter. They just they just own Bitcoin somewhere on the electronic device that they see. Well, yeah, like, that's they just one download of the an application you. from you know sure. from the Google Play Store and they storing their Bitcoin on their phone, or they saw like an ad for a secure hardware wallet and they're using that at home and they don't want anything about Bitcoin Twitter or people Bitcoiners or, or Bitcoin conferences. They but just I, see like the number is going up. I, I, I don't mean I don't mean just those people. I I mean there probably are like a decent number of people who have been in Bitcoin a long time are like technically competent and kind of know what's going on in the space. Uh, you know, keep their own keys and stuff, but just aren't uh, you know, people who enjoy yeah, interacting with the public, you know. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I was I was more curious like where where do you sit down? Do you think people have a responsibility to engage in the uh, kind of uh, in the mm. public sphere? Um, do you see that as like part of your duty as someone holding or because like here you're talking about how important of a layer that this is, um, that, you know, people need to trust each other and kind of, you know, fight against, you know, social attacks. But like, let's say I, you know, was into Bitcoin back in 2010 and I, uh, which I wasn't, uh, but uh, like, you know, it, like to have a big stack of, you know, coins, but, you know, I don't like Twitter play more as I'm not a really outspoken person. And, you know, I make sure that I'm safely storing my coins and I'm dumping my forks, blah, blah, blah. But I don't participate in the kind of broader, um, you know, public uh, interactions, like, would you see someone like that as kind of, you know, shirking their responsibilities? Um, you know, do you think they should take a more active role? Or do you think that's a perfectly acceptable thing to opt out of the whole reputation game? Well, it's a choice. It's, it all comes down to being a choice of what, what you're going to do. It's, it's everybody's right to you know, opt out of the game and just, you know, be completely invisible. Because was how I kind of observe it is that, you know, most people who are on Twitter, they like internet. They are social human beings. They like to, you know, make connections with each other and share common goals. And, and like, kind of this is good because, you know, they're, they're, they're able to, you know, defend Bitcoin this way and be able to, you know, advertise it to others. It's like, it's like a decentralized marketing network, kind of like keeps promoting Bitcoin every day, every time, 24 seven day. And people who opt out of it, that's okay also. Maybe you have a lot of Bitcoins and you don't want to participate in it. But it's not really going to change it that you are also using Bitcoin. You're holding it. You're contributing to it silently. Somebody is just, you know, really loud. They go on Twitter or they troll all, all day long. They should post Roger Ver or somebody else. <laughs> and it, it, it's totally fine. And and that's one thing because, because for example like like what I feel is that you know is that I'm in a situation that I feel betrayed by the system. I have to go up to, onto Twitter and open my mouth and keep talking and tell people like that like this is wrong. We need to keep start changing the system, start using Bitcoin, and it just it's like a fight against the system. So it's like it's like kind of like a, a frontline experience if you're living true right now, fighting on a battlefield. It's uh, it's quite difficult to explain this because this goes too much into philosophy, like how this works. But <laughs> but um, I think it's not totally okay. People will decide what they do, and and that will be the right choice. But maybe security by that, I don't know. Maybe that's a lot better option because they're not really announcing like who they are. 
not doxing their voice like I'm doing. Well, it's, or it's safer. It's safer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you know, a lot you safer. <laughs> you, know, you don't run the risk of, like, I mean, look what happened to Jameson Lop, you know, like someone swatted him, yeah. you know, like, you know, yeah, that's not going to happen if you are, you know, keep your mouth shut and don't have any public identity. Um, but you know, you can take the fluffy the... pony route and kind of let everyone know that you lost your keys in a tragic boating accident. But, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. it's hard to see how much people will believe that, right? Yeah, <laughs> it definitely is. It's a lot more boring, you know, being alone and not doing anything. And like, yeah, I see the point at it. If you have a lot of money, you could probably do that. But, you know, people who are in this, you know, in this, this plap space, basically what I would say, they're much more stronger together. They, you know, they start, you know, the plebs, for example, um, within Bitcoin, they start, you know, interacting, you know, forming connections among each other. And it's, you know, this is kind of forming this per this permanent bond. They, you know, not all, not always changing, maybe sometimes changing. But over time, you know, is, is Bitcoin going to become much more valuable? These connections basically going to, you know, play a, a major role in how the world is going to progress. Because, you know, some of these Bitcoiners have a lot of Bitcoins, basically. And and they're going to be starting new businesses. They're going to become the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, buying land, doing all kinds of stuff and changing the political system, probably. And, like, this, this is the whole point of it. The people who are more social, they are more adapted towards survival because they try to, like, you know, interact more often and form connections. And, you know, these connections later on down on the line are going to be much more better for them than for those who are not interacting at all. That's what I also told about the, the Citadel 21 article. It's like, like, you know, you need to form these connections else you, you're missing out on this game and you're going to be going with a with a, with a trust disadvantage in the future. Because, you know, you don't know anybody who going to do business with you if you're not in these circles or something. And then that's going to be much more harder. But then, you know, some would also argue, like I had a chat with Shinobi back then, that he said, like, there is no Bitcoin community. Okay, there is no Bitcoin community, but there are people who form smaller communities within the space who can have a form of community operational there. And this is really important. Because, you know, like... We're gonna be probably the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Just you know, we're gonna go up to Bahamas and die there and spend all Bitcoin. I don't know, something. Like that. I know some people who just wanna have a, a vacation until they die. I mean, that's okay. You have to spend your Bitcoin one day. Like, I'm not there to judge people how they're gonna do it. I wanna make more Bitcoin, of course. I wanna start businesses. I wanna do this and that. Maybe I wanna go on the Bahamas or something. Also, like have a good some margarita or something. So, but yeah. Well, and Bitcoin gives you the power. Like, it doesn't discriminate. You can essentially, it's your money. You can do with it what you want versus oh, yeah. what you see in the traditional financial system. There's so much scrutiny. And, you know, it has good sides and bad sides. Uh, you know, people always say, oh, well, KYC is there to protect you and, you know, keep you safe from things. But it's also there to restrict. Um, and, and I think the fact that you don't have control over your money and somebody has a, an option to say, we don't think you should do that, um, I think that's really dangerous. It is dangerous. It's all about controlling people. It's it's not about controlling the movement of money, but movements of people and what they do. It's kind of like, you know, like controlling their brain. But, you know, when you control the money, you control the people also. True. And, like, with Bitcoin, it's like, no more border anymore. You can do whatever you want. You, illegal stuff, buy drugs, whatever else. It just, there's nobody who can tell you no. It's like nobody, impossible, no judge, no law, no ruler, no government, no police, no army can tell you to know. It just came over for government. And, and this is really revolutionary because now for real, people are now in possession of their savings, their money that they can, you know, spend however they want. They can keep holding on to it. They can spend. They can buy stuff. Whatever else, and you know, even when people start coming into this this space, they're not rejected. People who who kind of you know, you know, interact within the space. So even on Twitter, they accept everybody in. They don't do the KYC, you know, <laughs> but you know, Bitcoin needs everybody. Bitcoin cannot operate without human beings. That's the only thing it needs. People say that that you know. Your action is not required, but your participation is. 
because if you don't participate, the network is going to become weaker. And without people, Bitcoin is nothing. It's just a, an algorithm running and a software running on some hardware. And that's it. That, that's oh. beautiful also in it, like that, that a software requires human beings in order to live. Even if uh, humanity would be wiped out, Bitcoin would still operate. It would still keep, you know, looking for human beings, you know, to use it, even though it wouldn't find any. And it's kind of like there's a beauty in it. Yeah, I like the fact that, um, you know, it's consensus driven network and it just it works. There's there's no one main authority that says, you know, you can do this and there's no governance process. Um, like you see in some of the other coins, you know, they're trying to recreate the governance process, uh, which I, I think is a, you know, fundamentally a bad idea. Um, I think we've seen time and time again, as soon as you have uh, any kind of government or people in charge, it, yeah. <laughs> it leads to corruption, right? Yeah, it's almost like it's mm, an inevitable yeah. end state. R really big corruption. It's just crazy what's going on down there. It's just all these foundations that are created for shit coins. The whole purpose is, is like driving up adoption and pumping like bang, like, oh, I'm going to pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it. It's like, <laughs> it's all just going for that. It's, shit coins are the biggest scam in human history. That's it. It's, it's like, I don't even know what to compare it with. It's like a new, new category here. It just, there's no words for it. Bitcoins, uh, it's like Bitcoin doesn't even know governance. We we kind of like decide on it with anarchy, throughout anarchy, I think, when like what happens, like how we protect, you know, value of our money and the integrity of the system. That's how, you know, kind of like the UASF movement kind of went down. That was really the first such moment in Bitcoin to kind of prove that, that there is a social layer there that's really important. Because uh, that small minority that was the most vocal about it were able to protect it. And it was able to protect it. And that's the most beautiful thing about it. Yeah. One thing. Go ahead. I was just, I'm surprised that you actually would call USF a minority. Um, I guess, like, I mean, Bitcoin itself makes it very, like, fundamentally, you can't measure how many people are in each one. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, so I, I guess I, uh, I I don't often think of it as minority because I I usually think that the USF movement represented the um, the will of most uh, economic value in the space. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, is there? Uh, but I, I guess maybe you're talking more about local minority and the kind of the tolerance uh, sense in that. Uh, or basically, did yes. you say the word? Uh, did you say intolerant minority or vocal minority? I forget which word uh, you used. Like intolerant minority. Okay. What I was referring to, because you know, what I was just saying is that you know, even though people who were participating in it weren't everybody who were using Bitcoin. That's what I was referring to. And these people were even like the frontline warriors of Bitcoin who basically managed to defend it. And that, that's the main point. It might be, uh, you know, the strongest majority to manage to, you know, uh, push their, their, you know, their opinion through. But it was still the minority that managed to do it. Because, you know, in the end of the day, people who participate on Twitter and not, you know, within the space are, you know, those are the majority, the silent majority that we don't see. And then people on Twitter, those the, the are just a minority here. It's it's really interesting. It, like it's like you know, I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it's like it's a bit paradoxical. What I like about Bitcoin is the fact that you know all voices are welcome, and it's not, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's not like the corporate decree we're going to go this way, and this is the way we're going to go, and that's that, and get on board, or you're going to be left behind. Uh, there is the opportunity to you know to try to determine that. Um, you know, we don't think that's right. And just because some people got together in a, a back room and decided that this is the fate of Bitcoin, um, I think the, the network definitely stood up pretty strongly against that. Pretty much, yeah. Like corporate interest that was trying to like change the entire network, like with the New York agreement and all this stuff. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's just school. It's like, it's... Uh, 
not sure how to explain this, but I see what your problem with, you know, the minority. Maybe I worded it wrong, but but yeah. It's you know the whole point was here like is like imagine this like being like an attack by an outside force that have a you know an agenda. What they did is that they wanted the best option for themselves to add changing how Bitcoin functions. And this was kind of wrong because you know they were they were agreeing within closed doors and they weren't allowing anybody else and other opinions to come into it. And as you know, that was a normal reaction from from the majority, <laughs> basically, to you know to reject it completely and stick to the consensus. And 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 that that was the totally natural way how it could happen, or how it how it had to happen. And you know, this kind of like managed to put an end to this hostile takeover of Bitcoin. And and we see that's it, <laughs> kind of I think. Yeah, I could see that, you know, um, yeah, essentially the, you know, each person's voice isn't eclipsed by that, you know, that governance board that just says, this is what we're going to do. Um, there is the opportunity to, you know, to have different opinions. And, uh, you know, somebody, if somebody attempts to hijack Bitcoin, um, that gets pretty, pretty quickly, um, the right wording here. <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure I know the right wording, but um, I do love that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is, uh, I think Mir put it, put it really well uh, the other day on, on Twitter. Um, all you need to know is that Bitcoin uh, gives power back to the people and really it truly does. It's so much power and just, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Like I never before in my life felt this free and the power that Bitcoin gave into my hands it just is it's so liberating because you know i kind of realized that i was always living in a fresh life and and bitcoin kind of opened the door for me the door of possibilities for me and i've been feeling a lot better ever since i saw my you know my kind of my life completely turn around with me going to places i never been abroad this many times before like in 2019 and it's really changing people. Like I'm pretty sure there are people out there who could really talk about this with more insane turnaround. <laughs> but like for many years, for example, I was battling depression back then from 2010 through some family issues and everything else. And I wasn't really, you know, how would I say I was in a dark, really dark place back then. And I was, you know, trying to, you know, find the light out of the top, I mean, the light you know, at the end of the tunnel, and it, it kind of never wanted to come. And it's when, you know, I kind of like, you know, kind of found it back in like something like 2014. And then I started going. And then, you know, the whole brightness and everything came, you know, in 2018, when I kind of discovered Bitcoin. And ever since then, it just, it's been moving my mind every day. I just can't stop thinking about it. It's just Bitcoin 24-7 a day. It just that possible stuff anymore and it's just so interesting like it keeps my focus completely it just i have to keep looking into it have to keep reading about it have to keep learning about it because you know if i'm gonna miss something I'm gonna get out of the game accidentally or something <laughs> like miss out on something yeah basically cool. um so what do you see this actually might be a good good question to ask um what do you see for the future of bitcoin where do you see it going what does it need uh, it's definitely going to change mankind. Society is how we live. There's many points I had in my thesis in the end that I kind of concluded. But I think it's a net positive for humanity, in my opinion, that it, it, that it, that it exists. Because, you know, a world without Bitcoin would be a catastrophe. If Bitcoin somehow would be halted, as in, or erased in a way that it cannot be restarted or, or that the entire database is just vanished. It would be plunged back into the abyss, you know, this, this dark age that we live through right now. And we would be never be able to, you know, get rid of, of, you know, of the federal reserve or central banking or the effects that paper money have on us. 
because you know after that we, if, even if shit coins would remain around it would be uh, a dystopian society because uh, the power of government and and central banks would become solidified and they would remain in power forever because a bitcoin that is restarted in a from from zero that wouldn't would never be able to build back the amount of trust and 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 like support and and its social layer that bitcoin have right now so this is like the only shot we have at this game right now and and it's so important it's just it's so important probably that some people realize it in their brain that this is the one shot that we have and that's why some people kind of want to join the community that they care about it some people who have a lot of bitcoin who started early maybe they they don't want to participate in the community because they know that they are holding bitcoin and not spending a lot of it and try they're not spending they keep holding on to and providing value to bitcoin on the long term that's also opportunity i mean an option there you know with participation the people who you know really want to change the system you know the revolutionaries who are always you know big talkers and do everything on twitter they they are basically like 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 the how would I explain it? The best thinkers, the biggest heads here, and the most lucky people out there who really managed to get on get on board this this train or or you know, rocket or whatever it's gonna be towards the moon. But <laughs> and that that's really great about it. Like Yeah, basically. So one of the things you said was about um uh uh, how, you know, if, if Bitcoin disappeared, we had to send in this dystopian society. It sounds like kind of by extension, you're suggesting that we've been living in one for the last few decades, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Basically. Um, so uh, what would you say to like someone who's new to this space and is skeptical of this thesis? Um, uh, and they, they point out that, you know, by a lot of metrics over the last, you know, 30 or 40 years, uh, uh, the standards of living have improved <laughs> for a lot of people, like infant mortality has been reducing around the world. More and more people have been lifting out of poverty for the last uh, several decades. Uh, that seems to kind of go a little bit against the thesis that the current monetary system makes everything worse, because at least by some metrics, things have been getting better. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, uh, you know, like, is that a conflict or do you think that's just a misleading thing to point out? Okay, so I never really looked into this, but I can speculate about why it is happening. Mainly what I would say is that, that, you know, technology changes over time. We had really great technological innovation in the past 100, 200 years. And this kind of led to automatically to the improvement of quality of life. And this kind of decreased mortality rates. But, you know, there are other processes that require, you know, value production for people to be able to sustain some sort of a basic societal functions within society. Like, you know, like uh, forming uh, families, having children. You know, and, and this is the whole catalyst behind this thing is saving. And now, right now, this whole thing with savings is being manipulated. Like, look at the U.S., for example. Barely anybody have, like, uh, enough savings to, you know, afford an immediate emergency or something. And they immediately have to, what they reach for, they reach immediately for loans. Because, you know, their high time preference immediately demands money in order to spend. Even for nas- na- I mean, basic necessities, now you have to have a, a credit card, you know, going to McDonald's and pay for a burger with it or, or pay for bills or whatever. You just keep spending the money because, you know, you always have the urge to keep spending, spending, even spend your future money that you could you know, be saving. And it's just, it's a never ending evil cycle here. And this is something what I think not many people looks into it, like how this kind of can break down society. Even though, our quality of life improves, it, it might not. Because if you take a look at it, for example, the quality of food been decreasing for quite some time now with added, uh, added additives and sugar and, and other substitutes coming into food. Because, you know, as, as more people become obese in the U.S. because they're consuming more sugar and stuff like that, that all can be thanked to, you know, high time preference. I had this thought about it like a couple of days ago, like, like, you know, why so many people are sick or why do they have such problems with heart disease and things like that? It's you know because you know the whole system is pitted, pitted against them. They have to buy the lower quality food. They cannot afford to buy steaks and things like that in order to have you know a healthy diet. But you know they have to buy the you know sugary stuff. They have to buy you know the vegetables and all these other things. 
that you know that that's the cheapest. Even though the vegetable prices be more in the fossil, so they're being pushed towards more you know the artificial flavor and stuff, and you know like the the fake hamburgers and things like that. Or like you know they can just you know put onto a factory line and keep printing out mm-hmm. and cranking it out like patties. Oh yeah, it's fake food. What the hell? I don't want just one. Oh my god, I can eat. It. Okay, so that's basically it, and it kind of makes people sick long term, and that's what, you know keeps driving up the prices and the competition between hospitals in the, in the U.S. for example. You have to have, you know, all these fees there for, you know, for treatments and then the complex way, you know, health insurance work. It's just, it's just a whole game to, you know, to, to keep churning more money out of people, basically, and the government, and the government. Because, you know, even though you're just paying a portion of your, your health insurance, the government going to be paying the most of it to tra- Medicare Medicaid. And that's so interesting there. You know, they can manipulate these things and, you know, have the government pay more because they know that the government is always going to be printing money. And now what's going happening? Government is printing money and sending Americans, you know, these these emergency checks. And what they're gonna do? They're gonna spend it. So hell yeah, McDonald's gonna lower the prices or raise it probably so that they have more income over time because people are gonna be buying more stuff there, more unhealthy products. And this is gonna all this keeps going on. And this is like one side of this whole thing here. It's just crazy. It just. It's it's so intertwined problem that we have because of money is that I don't think like even one hour is enough to talk all about it. It's just like that, that's what I kind of like you know, like like kind of went in with in the in the first section of my thesis with this whole with, with the money is that you know, money drives everything and money if 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 if, if somehow we're able to fix the money. We can, you know, slowly change society around, maybe have healthy food again, maybe have normal stuff in our life again. We're not going to be buying electronics, uh, you know, every year because we can have, you know, reliable electronics with normal operating systems on them that, you know, that get updated every year or they get the security. It's not like Android forcing you to buy the new device because they're not releasing you the security patches for the old incompatible devices just because they want to have, you know, their share price keep going on, you know, that they can turn out more devices and electronic that keep, you know, creating e-waste. That's the whole thing. Even with, you know, for example, here in Hungary, for example, uh, in 2014, uh, Coca-Cola changed uh, the portion size of their products. We had two, um, 2.5 liter products, for example, maximum size. Now we only have 2.25. You know, we see this shrinkflation going on because, you know, the whole point is that you know when 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 time preference increases within society, it's not just uh, time preference changes in society, but for companies also. But you know, it's not companies that receive the time preference; they inherit it from their shareholders. Because you know, when there is a shareholder, they demand immediately dividends from the company and profit so that they can sell the the stocks, the shares. You know, if it keeps going down, it's not good for the investor. Oh my God, my stock keeps going. I'm gonna sell it, and then the company gonna gonna go bankrupt. It can't get the loans it wants. It, it's not gonna have a good credit rating. So they need to, you know, they keep keep you know coming up with really crazy ideas how to how to you know how to have higher time preference and how to you know increase our time preference throughout that in order to accelerate their income. You know, they I mean their you know their profits. And this this the whole thing here is like it's happening because of this, because of paper money and how this whole thing functions. And it's crazy, <laughs> really crazy. It's like yeah. It's it's and, and when you know when you really see, see these things happening, that's when you start, you know, questioning whether um, whether like okay, this is reality anymore. Like what can you trust if, if paper money is a lie? That's what I also concluded that, you know, when people get into Bitcoin, the question really begins right at the door. Because if you, when you figure out that Bitcoin is the only chance in life to, you know, change the world around, everything else got to be a lie or something behind it. And you have to somehow verify it. But if you can't verify the truth behind it, you're unable to, you know, form a proper uh, concept of reality. But, you know, like Bitcoin basically trap mathematics gives people, uh, gives human beings uh, this still form of truth. Because, you know, people who, you know, live, I mean, who don't interact, interact with Bitcoin, they only in, only see, like, perspectival forms of reality. You know, they don't get the distilled forms of truth. Like, you know, when I say something like, like, the sky is blue, maybe for some people who is colorblind, the sky could be gray or black. So that's just a perspectival form of truth to me. But Bitcoin throughout its, its system is able to give me real truth. Like I type in the code, it gives me how much blocks it 
it, it had, I mean, what was the last block of mine? What was the hash rate or how many Bitcoins are in the system? And, you know, this some kind of boils down to people that they want to try to figure out the real truth behind things. And like, like that's when I see stuff, crazy stuff, like, even hard for me to accept, like, like uh, the anti-vaxxing, like uh, flat earth or thing like that. But then I kind of figure out, like, maybe, maybe there's something behind logic behind it because, you know, people question reality and they have the right to do it because it's their choice to do it. It, it was their choice that they don't believe it. They want to find out the truth and that's why they want to believe in something different. Yeah. yeah. I think the option to, to keep questioning is always good. And the minute you've got to accept something just on face value, you can't ask questions. Um, that's a, it's a very slippery slope into a place. It's very, very dangerous. Um, it, yeah. I, and one of the things I find for Bitcoin is um, for me, it starts, it starts getting you thinking a little bit deeper about things. You know, you question something very fundamental that we've all grown up with and just accepted on face value, what is money? And it kind of turns the question and, you know, answers what is money and here's a better op option for, for money. And, you know, you start learning about value and you start learning about, you know, like time preference. And uh, I know many Bitcoiners are into things like first principles and critical thinking and, you know, stoicism. And I think that the more we're able to question things and the more that we're able to, you know, it just propels us to a higher standard. Uh, if you're always accepting everything on face value, um, it's a, it's a real easy position to be manipulated. Uh, and I think we've seen that for, for many years in society, you know, you've got your, your programming coming to you through your, your television or whatever channels you're, you're watching and, um, people are just content to kind of sit back and, you know, life has been relatively easy. And uh, I think it's time that we start we start asking some questions. Yeah, and it's gonna even get even more worse because you know <clears throat> people don't know what money is. They have absolutely zero idea how how the financial system works. So what is money? Even even the one of the ex dean at my university said that that the Hungarian front is backed by gold. I'm like what? <laughs> like huh? and, and like okay, it, it's just like. I didn't think like it would come back this hard with, from reality, but but this this is the truth. People don't know what paper money is, and you know there's barely any you know good research targeting paper money. It's a fact. It's like it's crazy. Nobody's looking into these things, and then you know when they figure it out, they figure out this is the biggest lie in human history. Paper uh, the fallacy of paper money is the best kept secret of human history. Basically, it's like it's, there's no way to explain it because. It is such an open secret that, you know, that, that nobody talks about it. But, you know, people who are in the financial system, they know about it. People in central banks, they know even more about it. But they have to live with it because, you know, if they would start changing the system to, to a deflationary currency, they will lose the edge against other countries. Because apparently nation state can't exist without an inflationary currency because you know if you cannot inflate your currency you cannot have the competitive edge you cannot keep rising up your gdp you cannot increase production have you know stuff like this but but apparently this is basically ruining society also and if they would start changing it right now they will you know fall into an uncompetitive position and that will be catastrophic for some some countries and even for the U.S., the U.S. could never afford that. That's why I kind of disagree with with even this thing that nobody can create a competitor Bitcoin. That they cannot. They cannot. It's it's game over. It's it's the point of no return, because the no return point was in in 1971 when the gold standard was completely abolished, and there's no way back anymore. It's just over. Yeah, and I think maybe because we did have gold back currency at some point, people still uh, assume that that's the case. But um, when they find out, <laughs> it um, you know it definitely rips the blinders off. And I personally think that that's uh, that's not a bad thing. Right? It's much better to be living, uh, understanding what's actually going on, versus you know living some muted version of the truth that doesn't exist. Everybody's living in a dream world. But but the awakening is starting at least. I'm really happy about it. But I'm not sure how long it's gonna take. But I'm probably gonna say it through, like as as far as I did right now. Like just waiting, just a waiting game. You have to wait, be patient, keep keep stacking sets all the time, 
Although I don't really do that. It's kind of shameful. But anyway, that's that. Margo, what are your thoughts on uh, Bitcoin and, and society? Uh, that's, that's a very broad question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite as. Um, I, I, my, I'm, I'm more cautious about making the, the grandiose claims about how it will fix everything. Um, I, but I mean, obviously, I think its effect will be quite good. Otherwise, that wouldn't be working in the space. Um, I mean, even for people who are very skeptical of the, uh, of the very extreme narratives about how it will fix stuff, I, I think it should be recognized that at a very minimum, giving people the option to opt out is, is a tremendous improvement, even if Bitcoin itself. Um, fall short of some of its promises, letting people opt out of, you know, situations where they're, you know, perhaps being abused, like, you know, people in Venezuela, or if, you know, uh, you, you know, you seeing examples of, you know, PayPal cutting people off from, uh, funding for their business, the fact that they have an alternative to go to, um, even if it falls short of its grand plans will almost certainly force the existing system to approve itself. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I had Bitcoin good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we, we wrap up? Uh, I, I have one more question for Caro. I'm, I'm curious. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the general um, kind of overarching, you know, impact of Bitcoin as money. Uh, I'm curious, like on a more specific level, are there any particular uh, projects or, uh, or, or companies or kind of things going on in this space that you're excited to see develop in the next few years? I mean, I know there's a lot going on, but are there, are there any things that like particularly catch your eye that you think are really cool? Well, the Lightning Network, I really think it's important. Like, like I see it as a way, like, you know, onboarding people over time, but it, it, we can't really expect it to, you know, to really morph really fast. We just have to give these things their time. You know, you have to take time. All these things, they take time. And I kind of like expect, expecting it basically somehow to reach a level what the base layer is. Like we can use, you know, verse to restore back or balances on them, keep it, you know, really secure, like have hardware wallets, you know, interact with the Lightning Network. And this would be really interesting. I usually don't really, you know, take size on software, but I'm really interested in all these things kind of developing and the new stuff coming in. And that, that's basically it because, you know, like, Nothing else really is, is more important. But I'm pretty sure like, for example, Bitcoin could also go through changes. Like for example, like uh, on-chain privacy, that's gonna be a massive fight here. They're gonna be happening in a couple of years. They're gonna change the entire space, how people interact also. It might lead to big uh, lead to the biggest war we ever had. Also, that's it's interesting. Like well, how we have it the... could be. We have the issue of uh, you know, the block subsidy decreasing in the next few decades, which oh, yeah. is interesting as well. Like, how are we going to deal with the fees? And then, yeah, mm. maybe somebody comes up with an acceptable solution. Everybody's going to like that well, it's yeah, safe, I mean, feasible. The, the one thing in our favor is that uh, we have, you know, at least 10 or 20 years before it becomes uh, an issue. So Pretty much. We have time to figure stuff out. All right. Um, so... Carl, before we go, uh, let's see, hang on. Um, yeah, so do you have any questions for our audience or anything you'd like to ask them? And if so, how can they reach you? What's the best, what are the best channels? Uh, I don't think I have any questions for them, but they can always just reach me at BTC Dragon Lord on Twitter. That's quite sufficient. They can find all the links they can reach me at. I have a new website on my Keybase account. So it's quite cool. Check it out. There's all the links there. And I think that's it. Awesome. And then, Mario, do you have any questions for uh, listeners or viewers? And if so, how can they reach you? Um, well, they can reach me at uh, Mario underscore Gibney on Twitter. Um, or they can check out the Unhash podcast. That's where I hang out at. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Tell us what you think of the, uh, of the show. Cool. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, let's, uh,